Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. A new year usually means new beginnings. It's a time for reinvention, rebirth, and resolutions. Those with aspirations to shed some weight or learn a new language might join a gym or take classes. But if you're Bernard McFadden, you might try to completely reinvent yourself and how we celebrate the new year in the process. Bernard McFadden was born in Mill Spring, Missouri in 1868. He had a tough childhood, both physically and emotionally. His parents were often sick, and their illnesses eventually claimed their lives while he was still just a boy. The young McFadden himself also faced health troubles, but he was able to overcome them with the help of a farmer who took him in after the deaths of his parents. The manual labor strengthened his frail form, and the hearty farm food nourished him. It had been the perfect cure for his meager body, until he left a few years later to work behind a desk in St. Louis. It didn't take long for McFadden to revert back to his old self. When he realized how much he missed the way he used to feel, he returned to what he'd learned on the farm. Instead of manual labor, though, he began lifting weights. He changed his diet and became a vegetarian, and he walked everywhere, sometimes logging six miles a day. He also refused to pollute his body with tobacco and alcohol, opting instead to participate in activities of strength and agility, such as boxing and wrestling. McFadden also took his physique seriously, more so than any man he'd ever encountered, and he used his growing fame to show others what could be achieved with a life of proper diet and exercise. On a trip to England in the late 1890s, he partnered with a man named Hopton Hadley, who had invented an apparatus that mounted to the wall and allowed people to develop the different muscles in their arms, legs, and torsos. McFadden helped Hadley in marketing the device to the public. Then, in 1899, McFadden became an entrepreneur himself when he started Physical Culture magazine. It was more than a lifestyle publication. It was the start of something bigger than he ever could have imagined. Physical Culture spawned almost a dozen other magazines, ranging from true crime to confessions and even tales of the supernatural, if that's your sort of thing. He also wrote articles for other outlets on topics such as fasting and something he called the milk diet, McFadden, by this time, had changed his name to Bernard McFadden, adding an extra A between the M and C of his last name, and styling his first name after the roar of a lion. He wanted it to sound stronger and more masculine, although it was hard to imagine the man as anything but. Clearly, he modeled his life on pushing himself to the limits. He believed fasting was one of the ultimate ways for a person to control their body and show their superiority to others. From the 1930s to the 1950s, McFadden also launched a series of boarding schools dedicated to preparing young men for a future in the military. Bernard McFadden was a lot of things to a lot of people. He was a restaurateur, a hotelier, a publishing magnate, an educator, a model, a spokesman, and an entrepreneur. And at the age of 84, he added Daredevil to that list when he jumped out of a plane and parachuted over the Seine in France. Yet, of all the things he accomplished and created, only one has stood the test of time. It began on New Year's Day in 1903. McFadden, a proponent of cold baths to boost one's energy, invited 50 men and women to join him on a Coney Island beach in New York. He first led his guests in a workout, and then he had them all jump into the ocean for a quick, cold swim. The water was cold enough to take one's breath away. But the act of jumping into the frigid waters of the Atlantic on January 1st became something of a tradition. In his search for the secrets of life, Bernard McFadden had created the Coney Island Polar Bear Club, who continued to meet New Year's Day from that point on and swim in water that doesn't get much warmer than 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Today, the annual event draws crowds of thousands. Some are clad in nothing more than swim trunks and bikinis, while others don tuxedos and host tea parties among the shrieking revelers. They may not know the man behind it, but they probably wouldn't be surprised by his story. After all, 
It's more than a little curious. When we want to remember the good times, like birthdays and weddings, we tend to haul out the photo album. Each page acts as a window into the past, taking us back to the moments where smiles and tears have been captured on film. We can't help but be overcome with feelings of love, warmth, and togetherness. But for the inhabitants of Miyakijima, those photos might give off a more post-apocalyptic vibe. In fact, many photos taken here are of people clad in gas masks, as though everyone living on the island were part of some kind of doomsday cult just waiting for the world to end. And in a way, they are waiting for something. Miyakijima is a tiny island in the Philippine Sea just off the coast of southeastern Japan. It covers roughly 21 and a half square miles, with a population of about 2,500 people, which is spread across five settlements. It's also home to rare and endemic fauna such as the Izu thrush. But Miyakijima is perhaps best known not for what lives on top of it, but for what is brewing down below. Those who call it home must be on constant alert thanks to Mount Oyama, the volcano in the middle of the island. Mount Oyama has erupted six times in the past hundred years, spilling toxic gases across the island. In 1983, the village of Ako was completely destroyed. What's left of its elementary and junior high schools can still be seen among the igneous rocks. The terrain has changed considerably over the years, with new trails blazed, literally, by flowing lava. In fact, back in June and July of the year 2000, the volcanic eruption did more than alter the landscape. It changed the lives of everyone living there. The entire island was forced to evacuate. Ash plumes and sulfur dioxide gas shot 10 miles into the air. 17,000 earthquakes shook the ground for 25 straight days, rendering Miyakijima uninhabitable. Everyone had known the eruption was coming, as scientists had been tracking thousands of tiny quakes leading up to the event. Still, no amount of warning would have prepared someone to uproot their entire life in minutes. Plants and trees either died or were burned. Cars were abandoned on the side of the road. Those who left eventually returned home five years later, but things had changed for good. The government now required everyone on the island, whether they lived there or were just visiting, to carry a gas mask with them at all times. In the event that air quality became too toxic, masks would be needed to be worn until authorities said otherwise. But despite all that, life has remained much the same since the last major eruption. The folks living on the island go about their days much like anyone else. They drive to work and shop for groceries. People get married and have children, too. The island is home to kids, adults, and the elderly, all of whom are just trying to get by. The only difference is the sound of the blaring alarms that ring out whenever the air quality becomes too dangerous to breathe. Clearly, it's not easy sharing an island with an active volcano. However, for anyone hoping to visit the place sometime in the future, you can. When flights aren't grounded due to high sulfur levels or volcanic activity, the island has many sights to offer. Scuba diving off the coast, for example, is said to be breathtaking, an experience that includes the occasional dolphin sighting as well. But if you'd rather explore Miyakijima on land, just be sure to bring your gas mask. And if you don't have one, you can buy one. Just swing by one of the many gift shops and pick up what might be one of the most curious souvenirs in the world. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.